and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from September 1988. I investigate Bandersnatch. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with an update. But first, it's the news. Amstrad are said to be launching a new Spectrum computer very soon. Named the Sinclair Professional, details are very sparse, but some industry people claim it will be a mistake if Amstrad stick to the Spectrum model. Alan Miles from Miles Gordon Technology said it would have been better to move to the 68000 processor, as there's no market today for a Spectrum computer. The only details available, apart from the suggested name, is that it will have CGA style graphics and resemble the Amstrad CPC range. Staying with Miles Gordon Technology, and they're about to launch the SAM Micro Home Computer that's also Spectrum compatible. Criticising Amstrad for not knowing the key audience, they have taken the bits from the Spectrum and their own interfaces, like the Disciple, and brought them together to produce a new micro they hope will fill the gap in the consumer market. The new machine will have 256k of memory, all of which will be available all of the time, 64 colours, different screen modes including a Spectrum one, and one that can handle 80 characters, better sound and a new basic language. All of this plus it can play Spectrum games too. Sounds like a winner to me. Powerhouse, the once budget arm of CRL, have gone into liquidation. Initially part of CRL, it was split off a while back with my favourite person, Ashley Hildebrandt, taking the managing director role. Powerhouse have been in trouble for a few months now, as have CRL but Hildebrand kept putting out press releases making false statements about how the company were doing. It's now come back to bite them, and the company's closed its doors finally this month. Typically, Hildebrand was unavailable for comment. US Gold have signed a deal with Pepsi Cola to produce a series of games around the Pepsi Challenge. The first game will be called Mad Mix, and included inside will be a voucher holding a set score. If you can beat that score, you can enter a free prize draw to win US Gold and Pepsi goodies. And finally, I've been waiting for this month to come for a long time. With modems becoming even more popular, some magazines introduced new sections to cover the growing number of bulletin board systems. Popular Computing Weekly covered two systems, one of them run by someone you might recognise. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. At number 5 is Boogie Boy from Elite. At number 4, we are the champions from Ocean. At number three, Outrun from US Gold. At number two, Target Renegade from Imagine. And at number one, Football Manager 2 from Addictive. And that was the news and top selling games from September 1988. <laughs> days of the Spectrum, one of the more famous game companies was Liverpool-based Imagine Software. I covered their games back in episode 20, but it is their last game that holds the most interest. As the company ran into troubles around the back end of 1983, the events were recorded in the BBC documentary Commercial Breaks. Money was running out, possibly due to overspending on flash cars and motorcycle teams, possibly due to bad management, possibly due to the decision to pull all their hopes into two games, pulling programmers and artists and musicians from other work just to get them completed. Those two games were Cyclops for the Commodore 64 and of course Bandersnatch for the Spectrum. These so-called mega games would go beyond normal software. They would have features never before seen in computer games. To accomplish all of this, the Spectrum version would have to include a hardware add-on, which would obviously increase the price, but more about that later. Amongst the team for Bandersnatch were John Gibson, Ali Noble, Ian Weatherburn, Steve Kane, Karen Davis and Fred Gray. The adverts began to appear in February 1984, teasing that something special was coming. A few months passed and the adverts changed to a progress report, making light of the hard work that was going into these games. A 
another month passed, and the next advert changed to announce reinforcements had arrived. Were things not going as well as expected, or was it just another marketing ploy? By the middle of the year, the adverts again changed, this time to just a white page with two logos. Progress was obviously not happening, or the marketing team had run out of ideas. Game players though were still excited. If all the promises were true, Bandersnatch would surely be a brilliant experience. John Gibson, the lead programmer, whose previous games included Mola Mall, Zoom and Stonkers, when interviewed did acknowledge the game was not all hype, and that it would have been revolutionary for the time. It was a 176k game, and this extra memory would come in the form of a 128k add-on. The hardware, or at least early versions of it, could be seen in the commercial breaks program, but to make them cheaply enough meant ordering large quantities from the east, and Imagine at this point did not have the funds to do this, nor did they know how many units they were likely to sell. This left them in no man's land, yet another delay. However, at the time Imagine went bust, only 50% of Bandersnatch had been written, and they had already used all of the memory available. This would have meant a major rethink about the design of the game. The additional memory was reported to have put the game price up to about £60, and this was at a time when average games were costing just 5 So what was this game? What was it like? According to the recovered mock-ups of the game box and contents, courtesy of Mark Jones, the game was a massive arcade adventure set on an asteroid. The domed city was connected with glass tunnels, and you could interact with various characters. John Gibson recalls a fat bouncer character, a large dune-like worm, and a small worm-like creature. The interaction took the form of speech bubbles, and each character would give clues and information to the player. Bandersnatch was what we would call today an open world game. The player could make their own path through it, and all items, objects and scenery could be interacted with. The player could, for example, try and kill as many things as possible, or go on quest to collect treasure. The way the game played would be down to the individual player, rather than having set objectives. The game area was a mining colony, inhabited by a small number of beings with a limited and vicious police force. The game concept documents call it a Blade Runner-like atmosphere, with thieves, gamblers, miners and renegades, dressed in Blake Seven style clothing. You play a wanted criminal, tracked by the galactic police, but what you did from that point on was totally up to you. A bold idea then for the Spectrum. As time marched on it was clear the company and the game were in trouble. Imagine had tried to persuade Sinclair to buy the whole company and the games, but there was no deal to be had. The company accounts were in a mess and the directors were arguing amongst themselves and looking to move on as quickly as possible. Several court orders were in place and the only hope now was on the mega games. Sadly, it was all too late. The games were never finished, and all we have is short glimpses from the documentary and the box scans. Prior to Imagine going bust, a company called Finch Speed was set up by Imagine directors Dave Lawson and Ian Hetherington. Did they know something was about to happen? The company's aim was to acquire all of the collapsed Imagine's assets, including games and the mega games. Imagine was split in half. Finch Speed offered jobs to the teams behind the mega games while the remaining staff were left high and dry. Finch Speed then began to work on the QL version of Bandersnatch for Sinclair Research, a game never to be released. But parts of it went into a new game and a new company, Cygnosis. Their first game was Bratticus, credited as being very similar to the original Bandersnatch. The QL version was recently recovered from development microdrives in 2017, but the game is only partly complete. It can still be loaded and a few screens visited, but it's not stable and is easily crashed. Compare this to the Atari and Amiga versions of Bratticus, which by the way is impossible to control, and you can see the similarity in both gameplay and graphic style. Steve Kane and Ian Weatherburn set up Denton Designs, and took some ex-Imagine employees with them, including Ali Noble and Karen Davis. They were then approached by Ocean Software, and subsequently produced Gift from the Gods, another game that is considered very similar to the Bandersnatch concept. After all, it was near enough the same team, especially when John Gibson was involved. It was so close, in fact, that Cygnosis made threats to sue them, but later backed down. 
it seems the two factions from the defunct Imagine set out to recreate Bandersnatch and to some extent both managed it. They could not use the exact game or the name itself as this belonged to the Liquidators, but they used the ideas and routines originally planned to be implemented in Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch will probably always be something of folklore, we will probably never see it, but it did spawn some good games and companies from the ashes of Imagine. This is Sports Hero from Melbourne House, released in 1984. The loading screen for this game has an image of what looks to me like Jesse Owens, the very same image that Codemasters used and were forced to retract. I wonder why Melbourne House got away with that one. This is another attempt to bring the arcade game track and field to the specy. This version includes only four events though, the 100 meters, the 100 meters hurdles, the long jump and the pole vault. The usual control method is used, the old keyboard and joystick killer combination of left-right fire. The first event then, and we pick our level, I'm going for street runner here. The other levels are just harder times to beat, and different scenery in the top left window. You walk up to the line in silence, wait for ages, and then with a weak pop sound, you're off, stabbing wildly at the keys, and hopefully you'll get to the end and qualify. It all happens in silence which is quite eerie. The hurdles come next, a bit of key stabbing, and you press fire when you reach the hurdles. This is tricky to guess though, and often sees you tripping up. You have three attempts at each event, and even if you fail, you can move on to the next one. A long jump then, lots of key stabbing again, until you get to the pit, you press fire to plant your foot, keep it held down and then release when you're at the right angle, and hopefully you won't end up with your head stuck in the sand. On to the last event then, the pole vault, lots of key stabbing, hit the fire key to drop the pole, and you're supposed to release it when you're at the very top. However, I've never managed to get this one. I can do the others, but not this one. And if you succeed, the crowd go home. Mm. Even in the Olympic mode, the crowd are just silent, even if you break a record. The top left-hand section of the screen changes depending on the mode you're in, and if you go into the second level, there are lots of drunk people lying about all over the place. Where is the sound in this game? Why is there nothing apart from the weak starting gun sound? This is terrible. And this is what lets it down. And I'm very disappointed, especially coming from Melbourne House. Why did they think it was okay to release a game without any sound? Oh well, another one for the shelf then. Originally released into the arcades in 1989 by Atari, Hard Drive-In is a 3D stunt racing game where the player controls and races a car across various courses with jumps, loops and banks. Converting this to the Spectrum would be a challenge, and DeMarc decided to have a go. I was looking forward to this game, but as soon as I started playing it, I found it almost impossible to control the car. It took me ages to actually reach any of the jumps. It seemed the car was on ice. veered wildly about, and the frame rate made things worse. The other cars on the road, although you could see them coming, were impossible to avoid unless you went off-road, which slowed you down, and sometimes you can get hit by cars overtaking you. The graphics are, I think, a step too far for the Spectrum. Shaded 3D is a tough ask for our little micro, and it struggles. You can almost hear it screaming. When you crash, 
which is all of the time, you get an instant replay, which is good the first few times it happens, but it soon gets boring, especially the amount of crashes you're going to have. Sound is used well, with a nice engine sound, but it's the controls that let this game down. It's almost as though the Spectrum is struggling to keep up with the graphics and forgets to check the controls. It then picks up three at once and sends you spinning off to the left. You then try to counter, but nothing happens for a while, and then you go spinning off to the right, even at low speeds. After 30 minutes of crashing, I finally managed to get a full course of the slow circuit, even managing the loop, but lost control soon after. And luckily I wasn't recording at that time, so you'll never see it. You have to get used to the delay in the response, I think that's the trick in getting used to this game. However, this is tricky when there's a lorry coming straight for you, or you're about to fall off the loop. To be honest, I didn't like this game. I found it unplayable. I can see the challenge, but it's the wrong one. It should not be the challenge to use the controls, which sadly this game is. A high profile game then, that for me doesn't deliver. So many games coming out for the Spectrum, it's difficult to keep up. So here's a quick roundup of some notable games. Hyperkill from Matt Ricardo, a cybernoid like game with good music and graphics. Twin Light from Retro Souls, a game very similar to Deflector with great music and challenging gameplay. Sergio Lata Pina. This is an isometric game that looks great and has some nice music. The Incredible Shrinking Professor from Rucksack Games, a platformer with AY music and good graphics again. Jilly's Farm Volume 1 Soko Barn, a great looking isometric puzzler from Bob Stuff. Mighty Final Fight by Sachez, a great version of the popular fighting game on the Spectrum with great graphics and hopefully we'll have a review of this coming soon. Ninja Gaiden Shadow Warriors by Jerry, Paolo Arus and Diver, an excellent beat-em-up. Again, hopefully we'll have a review of this soon. Roused from Kevin Turvey. A great version of the arcade game Joust and great playability. And Bobby Carrot, a great puzzle game with excellent graphics, sound and playability. A review of this one coming soon too. And there are many more new games coming out all of the time, so I may have to do two per show to keep up. For this show though, I'm going to review a much requested Sword of Ayana. This is a massively impressive game from Retroworks. It was released in 2017 and is an absolutely fantastic game. You play a barbarian named Jarkum, who has been chosen to stop the return of the Lord of Chaos. After an impressive intro with great music, the game begins. The pace suits the game as you walk about the landscape. You can draw your sword to fight, jump and climb and the climbing animation is really good. If you find an enemy, you can whack them with your sword. And you can also break down walls to discover items such as food. The 
first puzzle involves two levers. Once pulled, an exit opens up, but the jump across is very difficult. That is, until I found out you could use the run key, and this gives you longer jumps. The game is huge, full of well-drawn scenery and sprites. Control is well thought out and very well implemented, and everything really knits together well. It will take you a while to get through this. The RZX playback takes over two and a half hours to get through, a mammoth undertaking. The music is excellent and changes as you enter new areas, and really sets the atmosphere. This is a brilliant game. It's so well presented and easy to play, but will provide you with a challenge. This is highly recommended. So companies, there were loads of companies, weren't there? What, what were some of your favourites, Paul? For me, it was um, it was all the early companies that, that dragged me in because they each had their own identity. Um, and yes, some of them had their, their own programmers and their own programming skills, but get, um, companies like Arctic and Bug Bite and Imagine and Ocean were all favourites. For me, when they started selling, not selling out, but being bought out by other companies, I became less interested in the company and less interested in collecting the games, if you like. Hmm. Quicksilver and DK Tronics. I'm just looking at my game shelf now and looking at them. Silversoft, all they're all really the early eighties, you know, eighty two, eighty three, yeah. eighty four companies. Not Ultimate, because I'm a huge Ultimate fanboy. I really loved Ultimate games. Well, in, until I think Nightshade and Underworld. I don't like Underworld, but no. Nightshade, mm. Underworld, and then they came back with Gunfright. Gunfright was good. But that, that they were they sort of sprang out of uh, of nowhere with with the first four and. Again, it was it was the company that you know once you you knew that Ultimate were putting out a game, you you were you saved the money, you had the money before the game came out because you, you knew yeah. it was going to be good because of the company ID. Yeah, I mean Ultimate were I think my favourite. Beyond were a good one as well. Beyond put some brilliant games out. I'm a big fan of Lords of Midnight. Have been really, I'm really. I got it. <laughs> You hadn't noticed. Um. <laughs> the only Beyond game I actually liked was Cytron. I couldn't get into any of those. I couldn't get into Lords of Midnight or anything like that. But Ocean, I thought, were a bit hit and miss. They had some really good games. Uh, Daily Thompson's Decathlon is another one for me that really stands mm. out. And then some not so good. I did like their original Kong. I liked Hunchback and not a lot of people did. <laughs> I did, except the third screen on Hunchback on the Ocean version is really, really difficult. Yeah, you, you do realise that I'm going to have to film myself trying to do that while we're talking about it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, look, I did it first time. Yeah, yeah. Houston Consultants, of course, one of the excellent companies. S yeah, some of their early stuff was rubbish, though, wasn't it? I mean, Spec Invaders, their version of Space Invaders was terrible. Then later on, actually, they they started to get the budget software houses, didn't they? So Mastertronic were kind of the first one. Well, they had a split, didn't they? They either re-released old stuff, or they had original stuff that was rubbish and, and wasn't worth full price. The three big ones were Mastertronic, Firebird, and Codemasters. Yeah, Codemasters. The three yeah, big, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another another thing that I liked um, or disliked, depending on which company you're talking about, is they either they, they tended to stick to one type of game, like Ocean usually did arcade games or, or action games. And then you had the company that split, like um, Arctic, they did a mixture of arcade games and adventure games. Yep. And then you had companies that just basically did anything anything they got there throughout. A lot did arcade games. Yeah, DK Tronics was at arcade games. Um, yeah. Quicksilver did a mixture. They did mostly arcade, but they did things yeah, like did. Uh, Velnor's Lair and things like that. They threw the odd odd adventure game out there as well. I tell you, another um, company that threw out a real mishmash was Micromega. Um, they did 3D Death Chase and Full Throttle and Brax Bluff. And then they threw out weird stuff like Dominoes and Monte Carlo. Actually, talking about companies that kind of branched out, Firebird kind of did that, didn't they? Because they had the Rainbird. Yeah, they, they had, yeah, they had a few Rain, labels, yeah. didn't they? And they had like the Firebird Gold that they did Elite under. So and they, they got the old Level 9 games as well, put out uh, Nighthawk, and they had Dungeon Adventure, Dungeon Quest, the Silicon Dreams trilogy as well, which was also Level 9. 
I'll be honest, I played very few adventures. I played The Hobbit. Really like playing The Hobbit. Mm. Um, Melbourne <laughs> House, that was a, another jumble of releases. They they had things like Muggsy and the, and the Hobbit, obviously. And then they yeah. put out Sports Hero and, and weird stuff that didn't quite work. Oh, what was the way the Exploding Fist they did, though? That was excellent. Mm, yeah, that was good, yeah. You know what? I bet there's some really obvious companies we've missed. I suspect there are. A&F. A&F were a good company big, uh, early on. They did Chucky Egg. Yeah, they did. Chucky Egg was excellent. I loved it. Well, I loved Chucky Egg. And they had a good version of Frogger as well. Uh, what, uh, about, what about Vortex? What did Vortex do? TLL, Cyclone, Alien... Android Ali- 2. I love Android, Android 1, 2. Android 2, yeah. uh, Alien Highway, Alien... Uh, uh, yeah, Highway Encounter. Go on, it, oh, software. yeah, of course, Software Projects. Software so, Projects, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a, Triangle. Microgen, there's another company, that, one of my early favourites. They produced some... Um, today, By this, today's standards, they're average, but I really like the early... Microgen games. We we haven't really talked about Imagine in their games. That that was another company that had hit hit and miss games. Arcadia was okay. Schizoids was rubbish. Yeah. Um, Mola Mall was okay. Ardidums was okay. Jumping Jack was excellent. Jurel. We haven't talked about Jurel. Jurel, yeah. Yeah, they did some excellent games. Everything from uh, Harrier Attack to what Saboteur and Turbo Esprit. Yeah, yeah lot, Turbo Esprit. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't think there's the that special mystery around companies and anymore is there we've just we've just reeled off about i don't know 20 different companies uh, and there are there are probably hundreds more sm- hundreds more small companies that that we've not even touched on but i don't think you've got the same landscape you, you know the little companies springing up with with names that you remember that we've, that we've just talked about that's i think that's missing from from today's gaming and the edge as well i can't i can't think of what the edge <laughs> did other than far light but they did some good ones i think Actually, looking on World of Spectrum at their back catalogue, maybe they didn't do it. <laughs> you see, you, you remember, you've got rose-tinted glasses on again. <laughs> is, isn't, isn't that what it's all about, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? It is, that is what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> this is 3D Death Chase, released by Micromega in 1983. I don't think this game needs much introduction. It's one of the all-time classic games and it all fits into 16k of memory. The game gives mixed messages though, in that the cover displays some kind of futuristic hover bike, while the loading screen shows a normal motorbike. Many people really wanted this game to be a recreation of the speeder bike scene from Return of the Jedi, and to some extent, that's what we got. There is a story, it's the year 2501, and the continent is ruled by mighty warlords. You are an elite mercenary riding the big bikes, and it's your job to monitor the forest for any evil bikers. You can fire at them, but only when you're at top speed, and only when you're in range. You hurtle through the trees, dodging left and right, and once you get them in your sights, you can blast them away. There are two riders per level, and the levels are split into night and day complete the level and it gets harder as the forest gets more denser. There are tanks and helicopters to destroy as well for extra points, but once you get past level 3 or 4, all your concentration is on not hitting the trees. Even the enemy riders take second place to this. The game has you bobbing your head from side to side as the trees whiz past. And this is just a fantastic game. A true classic. If you recall back in episode 41, I looked at the Smart Card, a mass storage device that was excellently priced and was a brilliant piece of kit. Since that review, the firmware has been updated several times, with new elements that improve this great device even further. First is the File Browser, or as it's called in the card, the Snap Loader. Because this card is not DivID compatible, it uses its own firmware, which luckily has been kept up to date, and the new Snap Loader has improved a lot since the first one. Apart from the fact it looks different, The biggest advantage is the support for long file names. This makes finding games much easier. It still works in the same way. You pick a game, press enter, and it will load. 
The next change is the NMI function. Pressing this during a game allows you to enter pokes or save the game back to the SD card as a snapshot. Entering pokes is easy. When you're playing the game, just press the NMI button and you're asked for a memory address and value to poke in. Once that's done, you can go back to the game. Saving a snapshot is also easy. You select the snapshot option, you're asked to enter a name, you press enter, and after a few seconds, you have your game saved back to the SD card. That's a great addition if you're playing lengthy games. Overall, I think this is a brilliant update to this already excellent piece of hardware. And if you have a smart card, I would suggest you go and update it now. Thank you.